That is an absolutely recruit sized grouping. Yeah. In part one of the series, we covered some of the background and basic musketry practices of the rifles in the Napoleonic Age. Here in part two, we'll cover some of the practices shot by trained men, demonstrate examples of more advanced shooting, including ranges out to 300 yards, as well as moving targets, and examine the badges and awards issued for good shooting. So without further ado, let's move on to the trained rifleman's practices. Now, this is very much my designation and intended to differentiate it from the short range anecdotal recruit style practices as explained in part one. While first class men would typically shoot at 90 and 140 yards, it was here at the latter range where possible qualification came into play. Here, six rounds per day were shot to a maximum of three days. So seemingly this range was the threshold of trained men. That said, men of the first class, termed the awkward class, were to shoot at 90 and 140 yards predominantly. I elected to use the 100 yard sight setting on my rifle. Service rifles were sighted to 200 yards at the lowest setting, according to Baker, and the men would have been required to aim low at shorter ranges. My rifle isn't sighted as such, and the fixed sight is zeroed at 100 yards. My point of aim was adjusted accordingly although perhaps not quite as much as it should have been. So there we have day one's practice, shooting for the second class at 140 yards. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now remembering the scoring standard of an imaginary ring drawn one inch inside the four foot circle uh, as scoring as a hit, uh, all six hit. So on to day two. So with six hits out of six, the register gets filled and we move on. It stands to reason that a certain percentage of any given unit would be in the first or awkward class. This range of 140 yards would generally be the longest range they would focus their attentions on. Once they prove their competency here, they could then move on to the second class and begin to focus shooting at longer ranges. 140 yards is not that far of a shot, but these practices began to reinforce to me of the practical nature of marksmanship with the Baker. Over the years, I have done a fair amount of practice with the Baker at ranges greater than 100 yards. These have been done predominantly in the prone position in order to maximize the accuracy of the shooting. As these practices went along, I certainly had to manage my expectations, predominantly due to the use of the kneeling position. So, day two of the second class practices. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, that's a little suspect. So if we can consider that that one at the top is within one inch, then all six have hit, and I have scored six hits out of six for two of three days. Now the standard being, of course, best two of three, but because I've already attained the standard here, then I don't need necessarily to shoot the third day. If this grouping doesn't reinforce the somewhat moderate expectations of the period, then I don't know what will. With six hits, that earned me a pass to the second class. Well, technically anyway, but I wasn't quite finished yet. Although the regulations are quite clear, although it's still confusing to me as to why, there was a degree of choice, presumably at unit level, as to which target would be used. My intention was always to shoot at both. Immediately noticeable was the narrowness of the figure target versus the ample width of the four foot circle. At this moderate range, however, the full size figure target provided more than enough to aim at. So there's day one at 140 yards. One, two, three, four, five, six. Guts aren't doing too well today. Every now and again, you come across a grouping that you're moderately pleased with. Such was the case on this day one practice. 
the six rounds on target more than met the standard of two. Going into day two's practice, I had no reason to expect that things would be much different. And generally speaking, that was the case. An interesting technical point was that in filming this particular practice, the camera was a fair distance away. The usual rhythm that you can hear when firing with the cock falling on the hammer was completely inaudible, and the rifle sounded quite conventional and unflintlock like So, day two at 140. We have one miss here on the outside, uh, but one, two, three, four, five. For a total of six. It certainly wasn't quite as good as the day one practice, but five hits out of six was more than enough. So what this meant was that after firing at the round four foot target at 140 yards, as well as the figure target at the same range, I passed both sets of practices. Despite the fact that the regulation called for an either-or kind of scenario, I passed both, and therefore I was confident in being able to claim that I would be eligible for the second class. As with the second class practices, my intent in shooting for the third class was to shoot at both targets. As demonstrated, I again elected to use the kneeling position for these practices. As the position most commonly prescribed, it gave a decent balance between shooting stability and the ease of subsequent loading in the standing position. I felt that this choice was well inside the spirit of the exercise. Well, here we are on day one of the third class. The standard here was four hits out of six, two days out of three. Let's count them up. One, two, three, Four. Oh, five. So missed one, well, missed two. I'm looking at the uh, position of the, well, somewhat generous grouping here. I would say that I'm shooting a little bit low, even with the uh, 200 yard setting. So I'm gonna raise the point of aim up somewhere around here because I was aiming here. And uh, hopefully we'll get more than four on target next time. A bit disappointing, yes. However, it made the standard. It was somewhat interesting that I had to shoot through a tunnel of bush, as it were, between the trees to attain the appropriate range to the target. I thought about perhaps demonstrating the lying position for these longer shoots. The terrain, however, would not afford it. I must say that conditions played very little in the way of distraction, save a certain degree of heat. There was little wind, and the beautiful sunny day was pleasant shooting weather. So, day two of the third class practices. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, <laughs> six. All right. Now they're all on the paper anyway. Uh, that's five hits out of six. So the standard being four, uh, best, uh, sorry, best four shots out of six for two days out of three. This is day two. Day one saw four hits, day two has seen five hits. So, it looks as though this might qualify me as a marksman in the 95th Rifles. Me easy now, Tiger. I suppose technically it does. The five hits makes for a pass in the third class. But of course, in the interests of exploring the history fully, shooting at the figure target was going to be required. Given my experience at 140 yards with a figure target, I knew that 200 yards was going to prove to be a bit of a challenge.
It was obviously getting very late in the day, and the microphone didn't get turned on. That said, the muzzleloading gods were certainly not kind this time around. One hit was not the result I was looking for. At least the rounds could be accounted for. The stinging defeat of my first failure to qualify did not sit well, I assure you. For day two's practice, I made some adjustment to my point of aim, as many of the rounds in my last attempt were high and right. This would bring the MPI down onto the target. All things considered, it didn't feel much different than day one's practice. While there was obviously some huge mental glitch going on with my finger and the microphone button, the lowering of my aim had the desired effect. The grouping, of course, could have been better, but I was able to eke out three hits, the minimum standard. I had one more day left to salvage my marksman's qualification. Day three's practice was for all the marbles. I must admit, it didn't feel too bad. Conditions were good. The rifle was sparking well. And walking up to the target, I had a degree of optimism. So that wasn't very successful. One, two, three, four. And yeah, I couldn't tell you where the other ones went. So despite my disappointment in only having four hits on the entire screen, upon closer examination, the third high hit on the right-hand side actually broke the imaginary half-inch line. And therefore the three hits earned a passing grade in the third class. To quote the Duke of Wellington, that was a near-run thing. Shooting did not end with the aforementioned practices. Indeed, it seems to be a stipulation that practices at 300 yards were commonplace. The range of 200 yards is consistently referenced as the usual distance for practice. This was generally the maximum range shot at by the second class, and the third class shot at 200 yards occasionally, as mentioned in the text. What appears to be more typical of the third class was the range of 300 yards. Were the qualification shoots done at 300 yards by the third class? There's certainly room to speculate that they were, within the confines of the text as written. There, the distance is phrased as the third range, or 200 yards, or upwards. So, did the third class warm up at 200 yards, and then shoot their qualification at 3? I suppose we'll never really know. Now, there is an earlier video published on the channel specifically dealing with shooting at this range. There's quite a lot of detail regarding sight settings and the like, and I would initially encourage the viewer to watch that video, if the subject of shooting at this range is of interest. Although this previous video about shooting at 300 yards was quite comprehensive, Perhaps for the sake of completeness, I decided to undertake a generic application of five rounds at 300 yards using the figure target. This would seemingly give the most interesting results. With the sight set at the 200 yard setting, aiming would have to be high. an effort at 300. One, two, three, four, no, oh, five. Bit of a flinch down there. So my point of aim was the top of the head, yeah, in the center of the target. Obviously I need to aim a little bit more to the right. However, elevation-wise, I think I'm pretty close. Field firing, using different positions for loading and firing, seems to be in evidence. Now, this is a subject that has already been covered in great detail over two videos already on the channel. I'd invite you to watch these for a more, shall we say, tactical approach to musketry. While the targetry may not necessarily be historical, it is certainly in the historical spirit.
Here, assessments were made and comments were passed regarding the use of the kit and clothing in relation to its effect on shooting. There was also evidence pointing towards the use of moving targets. Initially, blank rounds seemed to have been fired at individuals out in front. This practice graduating to moving targets and live ammunition. This seems of particular notoriety, as its application in the light infantry battle would be near universal. Good practice indeed. So, for a demonstration of this type of practice, I used a two-thirds scaled target mounted to a sledge. The practice was simple. Two engagements at 60 yards, thus scaled to 100 yards with one round per engagement. The target would cross from left to right. The practice was structured as though in a simple ambush, with a fire hiding behind some cover, observing the target until it reached the optimal position, then standing up and engaging the target. So that was the moving target, scaled to 100 yards. Two engagements of one round per engagement. One, two. He's not getting away. As mentioned previously, there were certain marks afforded those who were able to achieve varying degrees of competency. The first is the mention of a system of cockades, small white versions for those of the second class and a green example for those of the third. This was worn just above the black leather version that was worn as a feature of every man's cap. In addition, there is some evidence to suggest that prizes formed an integral role in the acknowledgement of good shooting. Cash prizes, although perhaps not of one pound as mentioned at the beginning, seem to be in evidence, and indeed Surtees recollects being rewarded with a sixpence and an early dismissal by his captain after an auspicious start to his musketry career. Medals issued at regimental level were also perhaps presented, and two such examples are shown here. Admittedly issued to volunteer rifle corps and not the regular army, they nevertheless give an example of incentives to good shooting that may have been used. So perhaps after all this, and most importantly, meeting the necessary standards as laid out in the texts, the addition of a green cockade might be an appropriate addition to the cap. I should perhaps make mention of the amount of ammunition expended in the course of the qualifications shown in this video. As mentioned in part one of this series, there were 60 rounds per man per year issued for target practice. Now, firstly, this does not necessarily mean that every man shot all 60, but rather it was the basis for the overall allotment to each company or battalion. So, with the 40 rounds issued in the spring and the balance of 20 issued in the fall, we must reconcile the allotment with the amount used in the video. Obviously, I shot more in the course of this video than the 60 rounds allotted per year. 64 to be precise. And this didn't even include the so-called advanced shooting of 300 yard practices or moving targets. However, if we look at shooting at only one type of target for each of the classes, then the numbers of rounds expended drop considerably, leaving ammunition for advanced or other more tactical schemes. The allotment of 40 rounds in the spring and 20 in the autumn would seem, given this context, to have represented enough to get the job done. I'd like to thank friend of the channel, Vince, for coming out and helping to pull the targets in those last evolutions. Couldn't have done it without you, V. Another particular thank you goes to Stephen Summerfield, author of The Baker Rifle and Early Campaigns of the 95th Rifles, among other titles who kindly provided some of the images used in this presentation. A link to his book, as well as others, are provided below. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.